Hello everyone and a warm welcome to today's webinar. I'm Helen Howard from Chatham House and I'm very happy to be facilitating what I'm sure will be an interesting event and lively discussion. So just before we move into that, a little bit of housekeeping to go through. So the webinar is taking place on the record and is being recorded. It's also being live streamed and we have further audience members joining via the Chatham House website. Uh, we encourage all of our audience members to tweet using the hashtag CHE events. And also just to note that we will be doing a Q&A section. So please do make use of the Q&A function and submit questions throughout the event. We also have a upvote function in there. So do feel free to use that as well to indicate to us which topics are of most interest to cover in that session. Uh, so during that session as well, there is an option to actually uh, ask your question directly to the audience using your microphone. So do indicate if you would like to do that as well. We're delighted to be hosting this event today on Rethinking Global Food Systems. We're actively engaged on this issue at Chatham House. So, for example, the Global Health Programme has been working on ways to foster improved governance, support open election processes and support transparency across major international organisations as part of its second century goal of promoting sustainable and inclusive governance. We currently have a programme of ongoing work focused on the food and agriculture Rome based agencies, including IFAD, which builds on previous DG election related projects with the FAO, the WHO and the WTO, looking at governance issues and in the energy, environment and resources department. We look at the environmental health impacts of food systems, including climate, land, biodiversity, and zoonotic diseases. And we also look at trade issues and policy solutions. And just as a recent example of our work, last week we published a paper on biodiversity where we evaluated the impacts of the food system on biodiversity loss globally and identified three levers to achieve food system change and uh, we laid out a series of recommendations for making the food system reform a key aspect of the numerous high level political events, such as the CBD COP15, the UN Food System Summit and the UNFCCC COP26 against the backdrop of the Build Back Better agenda during what has been termed the soup year. So I'm delighted to be joined today by three speakers. So we have Julbert Hungbu, Michael Kremer, and Esther Panunia. And just to give a little bit of a, a background to the event, so the format is that we will have Julbert speak for around 10 minutes, uh, where he will lay out his vision and his mandate in his opening statement. Following this, we will have a panel discussion with Michael and Esther. Well, where they will directly respond and we will discuss some of the issues around that for around 20 minutes. And then we'll be opening for the last 25 minutes to the audience for the Q&A. So do keep those questions coming in as we go through. So first of all, I'd like to in introduce Julbert Hungbu, who became the sixth president of the International Food for Agricultural Development in April 2017, Gilbert has more than 30 years experience in the public, multilateral and private sectors, including as Deputy Director General of the International Labour Organization, Prime Minister of the Togolese Republic and a number of the executive level positions at the UN Development Programme, including Director of Finances, Chief of Staff and Assistant Secretary General. So, Julbert, we invite you now to lay out your vision uh, for your mandate in the opening statement of up to around 10 minutes. It's over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, for uh, First of all, let me thank uh, the Chatham House uh, um, to, um, for organizing this, uh, this uh, session that will uh, allow us to be able to debate with panel members and as well as uh, responding to questions that the uh, audience may, uh, may have. So uh, distinguished uh, um, colleague, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, five years ago, um, almost day by day, uh, I was uh, a candidate for um, IFAD presidency. 
And I did so uh, because of my uh, fundamental belief in a more equitable uh, world, a world without poverty and uh, a world without hunger. And IFAD for me is an institution very well placed to contribute to um, such an ambition. My objective was then um, um, to lead this institution to a place where um, it could deliver uh, more and deliver better. Um, because clearly I do believe that uh, IFAD can make a real and lasting contribution to the, to the resilience of rural people and the creation of rural prosperity and sustainable, inclusive, and equitable food systems. But I was also aware um, four or five years ago, aware that in order for us, in order for IFAD to contribute to the transformation of the rural world, IFAD first has to transform itself. So for the past four years, uh, I have worked together with the whole team uh, at IFAD here uh, to lay the groundwork for IFAD to deliver on a much more ambitious agenda. So my first term uh, as uh, IFAD president uh, has been focused on reforms, be it from a financial reform, the operational reform and institutional reforms to enhance the uh, effectiveness and improve management, transparency, value for money, gender balance, and social dialogue with staff. These uh, changes uh, today, uh, I can say that they are paying off. Um, one important dimension is that the reforms uh, of, the, of the reform have been the decentralization. Um, when I took over, we had 16% uh, um, of staff in the field. And today we have doubled to uh, anywhere between 32 and 30, 35% because if I, um, we target, you, most of you know, if I target the poorest of the poor community in the poorest country, the last mile, the remotest area. So you can imagine that um, serving um, that community while keeping 85% uh, or so of the staff in headquarters is not the best uh, um, um, strategy. So we really want us to be closer to the people that we are, uh, um, we are, we are serving. So decentralization has brought us closer to those people and to the people we are serving and the government that we partner with. And that has allowed us to respond faster to their needs. So, being less uh, um, headquarters centric is also helping um, IFA to increase our own visibility and our relevance uh, in countries um, as a fully fledged development partner. Um, one of also the, um, the impact of the reform is interesting to know that last year, for example, our project uh, um, reached more than 130 million people um, of and uh, half of it or almost half of it uh, are women. Um, this is a 36% increase in comparison to the 97 million people that we reached in 2016. And that gives you um, another dimension of the impact of the reform. You know, it's good to also know that every single year, at least 20 million poor people will have increased their annual income by at least 20% given the work that um, IFAD is doing by increasing their productivity, the full security and the nutrition as, uh, um, uh, as, as well. So you can see that uh, the target that we set uh, for ourselves in doing those reforms is to create the condition for IFAD to be able to double uh, its impact by 2030. And I'm very confident that we are in the right trajectory for, um, for, for, for that. So looking ahead, um, what I had in mind is to consolidate um, in the coming years, to consolidate these reforms uh, made over the past four years so that uh, we can, uh, as I was saying a few seconds earlier, um, con uh, concretize our objective, our ambition of doubling our impact by, 20, uh, by 2030. This consolidation will focus on three 
mutually reinforcing areas. Um, first is the decentralization. Second is the, um, the two dedicated um, investment program that we are launching, which is the ASA Plus for the climate change for the rural communities, um, particularly the adaptation side, um, as well as the, um, um, the, the, the private sector that we really want to um, step up as, a, as, as, as well. Um, lastly, we, uh, we also want to pursue uh, our financial innovations uh, in order to continue widening and broadening our resource base. Uh, specifically, uh, we commit to, ha to having, um, in terms of the decentralization, um, the 35%, the 32, 35% I mentioned earlier, our game plan is to move to 45% of our um, global workforce in the field um, by 2025, while also investing in strengthening operations at uh, headquarters. The other plus that I referred to in the private sector, we will direct, um, directly address two of the greatest development challenges of our time. One is climate change and opportunities for youth by leveraging private sector investment. Um, our ASA Plus, which is the Adaptation for Small um, Agriculture Program um, Plus, will plug some of the financing gap um, for climate change adaptation. And this is going to be a central uh, um, um, program for us because why the total annual climate financing is now around half a trillion US dollar. It's important to know that only 1.7 percent um, reaches the, the small scale farmers in developing um, countries. So you can understand why we really want to step step it up. Equally, equally important is the IFA private sector financing program. Um, you know, it's important, if I may re recall or remind all of us that 80% of the world um, young people live in uh, developing countries and they are two to three times more likely to be unemployed than the adults. And they are also more likely to migrate when they have no opportunities uh, at home. In Africa alone, for example, 60% of young people live uh, in rural area. So as a result, this program for us is specifically focusing on the rural youth and rural entrepreneurship and on developing small and medium-sized rural uh, um, business. Finally, in order for us to double um, IFAD impact by 2030, we need to grow and grow financially. So the third element um, is the increased uh, resource mobilization by capitalizing on IFAD's uh, new credit rating. Uh, you know that uh, um, in last October, we, we did get the double A plus credit rating from both uh, Stada and Poor and, uh, and, 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 and Fitch. So our objective, the, um, the discredit rating opens the possibility for us um, to expand and diversify our resource base in a way that brings more capital to our programming activities, particularly the, uh, the poorest and most vulnerable um, countries. While at the same time, we need obviously to preserve the overall quality of our balance sheet of our assets. A huge financing gap, if I may recall this, threatens the world's ability to deliver on SDG2 of zero hunger. So we need to leverage um, ODA to attract more um, resources. And this again, um, what the credit rating will help us um, to do, the ability to supplement core ODA contribution uh, with um, non-ODA resources is essential for IFA to double its impact even in these uh, um, current difficult uh, times. Precision um, agriculture is another area demanding more investment. The use of digital technology to access customized agricultural information in real time and the potential to be transformation um, 
uh, that real-time information has the potential to be uh, transformational. Um, it has shown uh, its great potential in time when extension workers cannot reach farmers and can be even more transformational if uh, it is taken to scale. Um, because it's happened already, but we really need to bring precision agriculture in rural area to, uh, uh, um, to scale. Um, just uh, uh, in closing, it's important um, for us to really keep in mind that for rural people, food is both their sustenance and their livelihood. We need food system to be equitable and fair, not only fair to food producers, but also fair to processors as well as everyone along, along the, the whole value chain. So I am convinced that doubling if at impact by 2030 is within reach and making sure that marginalized rural girls and women, indigenous people, people with disabilities are part of the value chain. And that we promote agriculture practices that preserve the earth natural resources and protect biodiversity. Those are the global challenge that we are uh, um, looking um, forward. So if our job is to reach those who are often forgotten, those who are often marginalized and to give them the tool to enable them to realize their hopes and to live a stronger and more decent and resilient life in their communities. Thank you so much. Let me stop here for a moment. Thank you, Gilba. I'd like to move now to the panel discussion where we'll spend around 20 minutes with the panel to assess how government, civil society, the private sector and multilateral organizations can better build resilience and equity into global food systems. So I'm going to briefly introduce each panelist. So first of all, we have Esther Panunia, who is the Secretary General of the Asian Farmers Association for Sustainable Rural Development, a regional farmers organization. And Michael Creamer, who is a university professor in economics and the Harris School of Public Policy is also the director of the Development Innovation Lab and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Michael, could we come to you first? And if you could spend the next few minutes uh, just responding or adding some main points of discussion, however you would wish to use that time uh, just to, to respond to, to Jill Bear's um, manifesto there or whatever other discussion points you feel important to bring up at this point. Michael, over to you. Great, thank you very much. Um, you know, this is an exciting agenda that we've just heard and I, let me just uh, expand a little bit on, on why I believe it's, it's so important. Um, you know, the COVID epidemic that we're living through right now is a reminder of that we need resilient systems. And we've seen what's happened when we were not resilient to disease shocks. Um, we've also seen the importance of innovation, in this case through vaccines, in making sure that we can respond to those shocks. Um, we've, we've also seen the importance, in some cases, the, the inadequacy of systems for providing global public goods and for ensuring that innovations reach people equitably. Now, right now, it's in some ways very hard to think about anything except for uh, COVID-19. But I think the world is vulnerable, not just to these types of health emergencies, but we're vulnerable to shocks to food emergencies, uh, to food systems. And you know, we've seen that, we've, seen, we've had early warnings, just like SARS or MERS were early warnings of COVID-19. We've had early warnings of, of, of threats to our food systems. We've seen the food price spikes that have happened. We've seen uh, fall armyworm or locusts just in, in the Horn of Africa, East Africa alone. Um, we've, we've, and as, as the president uh, just outlined, 
you know, there's the looming threat of climate change, which is perhaps the, the biggest threat out there at all, of all. The work of IFAD is going to be key to trying to address these challenges. And also, for I, I don't just want to focus on the challenges, but also taking advantage of, of new opportunities. Um, you know, just as we face challenges in the future, there are also going to be opportunities. We, we heard about uh, the, the discussion of precision agriculture. You know, digital technology is opening up all sorts of new opportunities for the world. But unfortunately, precision agriculture is something that is reaching high income farmers, but is not necessarily uh, uh, reaching all farmers. So this is an ambitious vision that's been, been laid out. The goal here is going to be a, a tough one to meet um, appropriately. Um, that it's a necessary goal, but the goal of doubling the impact by 2030 is not going to be easy. It's good that we'll need resources for it. The credit rating improvement is good and to be con congratulated. The decentralization, uh, moving more staff to the field is, is very valuable. I think having some I think that does need to be complemented with dedicated programs as, as was laid out. Um, you know, adaptation and climate change clearly is something that, that justifies that. There's the private sector. Um, the, I, I do think that one case where some type of, of, of uh, centralized uh, funding is valuable is when you're funding innovation that can be a global public good and that will, where the benefits will reach not just one country but multiple countries. Um, and I think that's and ensuring that 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 innovation will benefit all that will benefit youth as we heard that women indigenous communities. That's not something that will necessarily happen if left to the market alone that will require some some central global support. Um, I would, you know, digital agriculture is an area that I've worked on. So let me just conclude with that. Um, um, you know, this is an area where I've worked as a researcher. I think there's a lot of evidence uh, now of, of the impact that this can have. Um, just reading some exciting new papers uh, from a variety of researchers adding to that evidence base in the, in the past few weeks. Um, I think as, as the president said, I think this is a, we have a unique opportunity now in the, this area. You know, COVID-19 is a crisis. It's obviously directly affected the ability food systems and the ability of extension workers to go out and work. But this may be a case where in adapting to the crisis, we can actually set the stage for a direction that we need to go in. Because if we're going to reach, achieve these goals and reach and double the number of people reached, we'll need new cost-effective tools to do so. And digital technologies are one way to do that. They'll need a lot of work to ensure that they reach everybody. But I think uh, bringing them to scale, as the president said, is, is going to be an important part of the solution. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And next, if we can invite Esther to spend a few minutes responding to Julba's vision, please. Over to you, Esther. Yeah, thank you, Helen, and a pleasant day to everyone. Listening to President Hongbo, I just remember that last year, I, together with other farmers' organizations all over the world, were in Rome almost at the same time this year for the Global Farmers Forum process. I think it was the last, the last uh, travel that most of us had no, before COVID-19, no? that, that travel in Rome. And... We know that two years before that, there was a regional farmers forum. It was part of the decentralization process of this global farmers forum. And we know also that last week or two weeks ago, you had the indigenous peoples, farmer, uh, indigenous peoples forum. So I would like to start with this because the, the farmers forum and the indigenous peoples forum are, we think, we think is very clear uh, manifestation no, of IFAD to work in partnership with its, what they call beneficiaries in their projects, but what we want to be called as partners and active actors in the work for promoting sustainable food systems. So what do we mean by sustainable food systems? It's a food system that is empowering 
to the most marginalized sectors of the of the of a country or of the world the the, the sector who produces the the food that that we that the whole world eats and the sector who has the most potential to to really upscale sustainable uh, innovations in the necessary support the necessary assistance to develop their own potentials and harness their full capabilities so in sustainable food systems we have heard so much about innovations or what innovations and many game changing solutions but i would like to really dwell on one thing that that i think we think can strategically transform you now food systems it's the partnership it's the strategy for partnering with organizations of farmers, of fishers, of pastoralists, of women, of indigenous peoples who will upscale, who will innovate and upscale sustainable food systems. And IFAD, you're doing good work on that already. So for example, in our part of the, of the world in Asia, we have a partnership with IFAD. It's, a, it's called uh, the Asia Pacific Farmers Program right now where we we receive grants from IFAD to build our capacities to manage our own organizations and to provide economic services. We have also received from IFAD a grant uh, uh, for called ARISE, which is basically an emergency and an emergency and resiliency fund so that we can uh, we can uh, respond to the challenges brought about by COVID to our member uh, family farmers. In the field, in the field, uh, in, in some of your projects, we have seen the partnership between the IFAD country portfolio projects and, and the farmers organizations like in Cambodia when our member organization was a support, uh, was a service provider in conducting financial literacy uh, programs to the far, to the target participants of IFAD project and in Laos for example you are you are supervising a gaps fee funded project and you have entered into a partnership with our member there and even invited them to be part of the steering committee so what does partnership mean for us partnerships for us means not only being beneficiaries of IFAD projects whether it these are loans or grants, but it's basically us as equal co-partner in the in the design, in the implementation, and in the monitoring and in the evaluation of the IFAD funded projects. And basically all hopefully in all projects that receive for ex that are part of the development assistance because being active partners will will propel us will propel us to organize ourselves for example to think through what we can uh, present to the government and to the development partners in terms of our solutions or game changing ideas it will also propel us to build our capacities to really make you see that we will be capable of also implementing that this the solutions and innovations that we take so in terms of for example innovations in agriculture like farmers farmers to be considered also as scientists and as researchers in a participatory action research approach in in agriculture in innovations and experiments in in the field in the field of really developing uh, implementing projects it's basically for example we can at the ideal level we are part of the governance structure of our financial instruments for example or that you are developing like asap 2 and or, or being able to advise for example the the, the ifad in terms of the country portfolio that they are making by making consultations at the ground level uh, following your COSOP, your COSOP uh, uh, strategy. So partnership also that talks about uh, clearly sitting together and planning, designing, designing projects that will be good no? on the ground and including women and including youth in this discussion. So 
I hope that uh, this this word partnerships with farmers, with indigenous peoples, and when we say farmers, women and youth, pastoralists, fishers, no? uh, I think this. Uh, we hope that this will be a key strategy in empowering also uh, farmers and in, uh, to promote sustainable food systems. So that is all for my side for now. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Esther, and, and thank you also for, for your contributions. There's many interesting points there that you've all brought up. But first of all, I just wondered if Gilbert, would you like to directly respond to any of the points raised by Michael and Esther so far? Uh, no, maybe um, very. if I start from what uh, um, where um, I still left it, um, clearly I want to um, recognize that need to move from a beneficiary approach to a partner approach. So quite frankly, I want to uh, um, thank uh, um, Esther. Um, very often uh, I, I tell my people that in a lot of discussions that we have from time to time with Esther and her team, we always get the good ideas out of that. And this is uh, uh, one of it that you can make sure that I'm going to pursue on that. We start that um, discussion, the, what I call the, the, the agency dimension, the, the, the ownership and dimension, the sustainability of our action. Um, it really depends a lot on the ownership by uh, um, who uh, we are serving on, on that. So this is really why, and to see how she, uh, she put it very, um, squarely in the center of all intervention is something that I will uh, certainly come back in moving forward uh, in implementing our um, three um, key points uh, that I laid down in my uh, um, um, introductory uh, um, re re remarks. One point on that uh, um, Professor Kremer made, which of course made several points that I fully uh, agree, agree with, uh, what, one point that uh, it puts very squarely, I think is going to be important, we look at that. One is innovation. The second one, um, the, the, the second one is the whole uh, um, resource. Um, and the, the, the resource come back to the gap we have in terms of achieving the uh, SDG, SDG2. So I'm making the, the link with the innovation because uh, for me, the innovation on one hand, uh, we need to look at it from technology perspective, as I talk about, I keep talking about, about it, that uh, unless we, you know, unless we raise the productivity of our small scale producers, um, we will not um, be effective in helping them doubling their, um, their income um, as uh, required by the SDG 2.3. Uh, so the productivity is quite critical in my view, um, both the productivity of the uh, productive uh, um, resources, equipment, and the productivity of the farmers themselves uh, as individual. So for that, I think the use of technology is going to be essential. On the flip side, um, I see also the innovation in our financial products, <laughs> our ability to come with um, Obviously, the credit rating is a step, but it's far, far from being sufficient for us to solve the resource gap issue. So we will have to be also innovating in creating different financing instruments that will be responding to um, the, the condition of um, our, our partners that we are serving and will also innovative product that will help us also mobilizing on the resource uh, out there to complement our core um, resources. It's important to keep in mind that today uh, ODA has been uh, um, surpassed um, by even the remittances, for example, or the, um, the, the foreign direct uh, um, investment, the FDI in, in, in the low income uh, countries. So the financial innovation is going to be important. So that I want to link that to the, the necessity for us to um, looking at ways to increase the to, to resource mobilization, particularly as related to the um, to the rural uh, community. My 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 first point um, <clears throat> when we talk about the resilience that uh, uh, Michael um, 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 referred referred to. Um, 
what comes to my mind, as I was saying um, earlier this morning in another meeting, today we talk about COVID, um, which is a really big uh, challenge for all of us. Yesterday maybe was a, a tsunami in different parts of the world. Uh, tomorrow we don't know, but very likely we will have other crises. Uh, so developing the, the, the resilience as a glo global thing is going to be essential. What I'm leading at also is that when I look at the, the rural community, and I want to insist on the rural transformation. So to transform that rural for the community to have decent life, it, it takes more than just fighting against food insecurity. It's, it has to be a total approach. Um, food insecurity has to be a, 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 part, a part of it but also health, education, security, um, and all as a, a you know, my, 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 my dream is to have this community um, um, where it's really decent to live that you don't have that much. I mean, I grew up in those communities. So, uh, you know, you, you don't have that much to envy the city. The city will always be attractive and we will always have um, youngsters live in the rural area for the city. That one is very clear. But the more we will be able to create those conditions, the better it will be for us all. Over. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so we have around 20 minutes left. Um, unless Michael or Esther have any comments to, to make back to Jill Barr, I think we should move on to the Q&A because we have quite a number of questions coming in already. Do either of you want to come in now? No? Okay, brilliant. So we're going to move to the Q&A. And first of all, we have one for Michael. So in regards to Michael's point about a centralized promotion of innovation as a means of securing economic and social inclusion for the marginalized youth and women demographics, what specific measures would be effective in this centralized assistance? Would this involve promotion of entrepreneurship, increased access to seed and equity capital, making education for young people more conducive to innovation or other measures? Michael, over to you. First, let me clarify. I, th I think you know, decentralization, I, I'm, I'm broadly very supportive of the decentralization agenda. Um, there are some things that are global public goods that are difficult to fund at the country level. And in particular, uh, those are things that are promoting innovation. So if it's, if that could be adopted, you know, widely across many places. So uh, because you know, an individual country budget might not be able to take in, invest in something risky where the payoff uh, would be much broader. Let me give you an example. Um, and, you know, let me, I'll pick up here on, on something that, that Esther said, um, you know, a couple of things that Esther said. Yeah. Esther pointed out the importance of bringing in farmers as, as, as active participants in research, for example. Well, there are a lot of exciting ideas about there, out there about citizen science, about how to involve farmers in the, in the agricultural research process. But we also need to find ways to integrate that in with, with existing uh, scientific efforts. Now that's something that we require, that requires methodological developments. And we also may want to figure out how to do some of that digitally as well, because if you want to bring in large numbers of farmers communicating, cooperating with each other, they could cooperate over social networks to do that. But that all requires some development, some testing of new ideas, farmer feedback of that. Now, if you work out how to do that in one country, that's something that the benefits, you know, we'll have some failures along the road. But the benefits, if we can succeed, is something that could be scaled up across many countries. So that requires not necessarily, it doesn't mean that you have everything run in a top-down manner, but it does mean you need some central global funds to invest in it, and then fund a bunch of different uh, decentralized efforts to try it, and then in each one, but then ask for careful reporting and monitoring and evaluation so people can learn from each other. And uh, you know, just to make this a little bit more concrete, so this isn't really citizen science, but you know, just um, uh, you know, we're in the middle of, of hiring season in academics and just saw a wonderful paper from, uh, from someone from Pakistan looking at 
an effort to use farmers to communicate with each other, to hold government uh, more accountable. They, they linked up the farmers so they could give ratings uh, like Yelp ratings to the, to the uh, veterinarians who were doing artificial insemination. And some of them were, were doing a not very good job. They wouldn't keep the liquid nitrogen there. The, 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 uh, the semen wouldn't be, wouldn't, wouldn't, would no longer work. Others were doing a good job. Well, suddenly when farmers can communicate who's doing a good job and who's not to each other, well, then the, the, the veterinarians, the good veterinarians get more calls. The bad ones realize they better up their game a little bit. So I think now that, tech, that was, this was done in Pakistan, but this same approach could be used all over the world. So supporting many efforts like this uh, is I think exactly the type of thing that, that IFAD um, you know, can do and, and should do more of, and you know, we need more, more, uh, more resources for. Thank you, Michael. And I think Camilla wanted to come in on that as well. Camilla, if you're there, feel free to come in. Nope, sorry. Okay, Camilla has not. <laughs> Camilla has chosen not to respond. Okay, so our next question. So to build back better, this comes from my, Nick Sigler. To build back better needs a radical change in eating habits, both in the developing world and elsewhere yet none of the speakers have mentioned consumption or consumers. What changes in consumption habits are necessary to build better food systems? And let's go with uh, Esther. Did you want to take a shot at this one? Um, yes, thank you for, for that question. So, um, of course, there must be a change in the consumption of, of, uh, in the consumption of food. No? We have to go to healthy and nutritious uh, diets. In developing countries, uh, we can say that in the most remote areas, for example, who are not so much affected by commercial advertisements about food, food shops like that, or fast food. So we can, we can see that they are still more into their traditional staples, which are, we can say, traditional crops. Which can be, which can still be very healthy and nutritious, you no know, like millet and sorghum. In the science world, these are called forgotten foods or neglected and underutilized crops. You no, know. but you but you know, uh, poverty in many developing countries are compelling, are forcing people to eat less healthy and nutritious food. Like for example, in the Philippines, we have uh, cases of diabetes. So we have so many cases of diabetes, no diabetes, and diabetes. We have, we 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 were thinking, oh, it's a it's a disease of the rich people, not the rich people, but no, it's now it's a disease of also the poor people. Why? Because we don't have much food, so we eat a lot of rice with a little fish. We eat a lot of rice and our we eat lots of white rice, which has lost its nutrients. Or we will just buy the instant pancit canton noodles and, and add some vegetables and, and one pancit canton will be shared by a family of five people. So our diets have, has not become that healthy. Then coupled with in the for the lower and me, for the middle and upper classes. So the, the the massive influx or proliferation of, of advertisements for, for fast food and junk food. So they tend to, uh, do, to, to buy more of these foods when they have the money. So I think that the eating habits in, in our countries, in the, de in the developing countries should be uh, changed by uh, really an awareness, a, a massive awareness uh, raising of that these foods, although they have a connotation that these are foods eaten by the poor, are actually very healthy and that we should continue to eat all these vegetables that are just planted in the backyard. No? So eat, eat this and then also have this awareness that many, some of the foods, especially the, so the fast foods, are, are not healthy at all. No? And therefore you should not crave for it every day. So the education should start from the, from the 
children and in fact from the mothers themselves because it's the mothers who who uh, prepare this food for the for their children so i think in, in ifad and many other development partners have now gone to nutrition as a component for example in their development part development projects and they are including nutrition classes for women and children and then uh, really trying to uh, in, uh, make the women aware about the nutritional or the healthy health benefits of these foods. Back to you, Helen. Thank you, Esther. And I wondered, Michael, if I could bring you in on this as well. I mean, obviously there's a convergence of the literature on the need for high income countries, especially to go towards a more plant based or plant rich diet profile. I wondered if you had any views on other instruments that might be different to the ones that Esther laid out and to help sort of tackle that end of the spectrum around consumption. Sure. Um, well, let me let me refer to um to uh, another uh, another recent paper. This is a paper from Chile. Uh, Chile just recently introduced a, a food labeling system. Um, and you know, just saw a recent evaluation of this suggesting that it was, it was to give consumers more information and to make that information more salient for consumers. And you know, the, suggest, the, the evidence is that this is indeed leading to improvements, not just directly through the effect on the of, on the consumers, but also because the manufacturers were changing their manufacturing techniques to qualify to, to label appropriately. And in the process, they were making the, the foods uh, more, more healthy for people. But I think we, you know, we do need to address, as the materials uh, outlined, both the challenges of, of undernutrition and, and the challenges of, of obesity. Um, and that's going, to be, um, you know, that's going to be an important part for the future. You know, again, just uh, you know, one one way that we can be using trying to promote resilience on the undernutrition side of this, um, using technologies, is you know, we can move towards a system where we can rapidly identify where problem where shocks are hitting, where droughts are hitting. If you look at, for example, what India has been able to do with its national identity system on giving. Uh, they can, you could now have systems or, if, or where you could identify where the people are living, the farmers are living who are being hit by shocks and you could target the, the food or other benefits to them in a way that's very responsive. So, um, you, know, uh, you know, Mexico, for example, has a system of providing dairy, dairy subsidies. There are pluses and minuses of such, such, but such systems, but you could target those to the people who need it in a very responsive way. So I think finding ways that we can have, have, uh, have adaptive, resilient uh, um, programs for social protection, and in particular on the food and nutrition side, is going to be an important uh, challenge going forward. Thank you, Michael. And next we have a question from Osman Da, who's going to actually ask this one live. Osman, are you there? Uh, hi, thanks for some really interesting insights so far. Uh, we've had controversy at the recent WTO DG election with a stalemate over the appointment of the winner because of one member state's objections. That deadlock was finally broken last week. Um, Gilbert, are UN agencies and other multilateral agencies transparent and accountable enough in their election and leadership processes? And do you feel that more needs to be done in the food and agriculture space uh, specifically? And I'm thinking about, you know, the Rome-based agencies that deal with food and agriculture. I know it's a tough question, but please, we'd like your insights and thoughts on this. May I go ahead? Gilbert, yes, please. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, as you said, yes, it's a tough question, but I fundamentally believe that uh, the experience that we have here um, in, in IFAD uh, um, appointment processes four years ago and what are we doing this year, including uh, what uh, Chatham House is doing, uh, quite frankly, I believe is the way forward. Um, I, I remember four years ago um, when we, we were eight or nine candidates, if I recall, and the, the, the hearing process has been quite very open and very driven, substantive, substance driven. 
Um, quite frankly, I don't know if I would have been uh, elected four years ago if it was not substance driven, um, or, or honestly speaking. So although uh, in a multilateral, let's also be um, pragmatic, you just cannot totally exclude political interference, uh, positive or negative, um, but we multilateral is also political. So for me, to have the policy, the political, uh, the politic involved is not what surprised me or worries me most. But if the politics involvement is not the, the only consideration, if the substantive driven trying to find the right person on, on, on that, I think the, the way forward, to be honest, um, if, if today, uh, I have to be very um, um, clear here, if today I can change a lot of things, be it in IFAD or other institutions, I'm not even so sure that we should continue with the principle of a country having to propose a candidate. I too believe that when they are um, candidacy, let people go and get um, one or two, or, or maybe even a consortium of three um, top um, hiring firm or, or what have you, going through some kind of independent process to come with a number, I don't know, three to five, and then bring that to the member states um, to continue grilling them, excuse my language, and, and, and interviewing them before the, um, the, the, uh, the, the, the election. So there are a lot of things that I think we could do, um, we, 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 we could do to improve the system. Obviously, there are cases that you will always have um, some exceptions. Um, I mean, I'm not expert in WTO, but I think that WTO, the importance of consensus based is something not to um, you know, ignore, given that it's, we're talking essentially about negotiations, um, which are quite very difficult subject. One can understand uh, some um, peculiarity to what I am saying. So I'm not saying that that should apply 100% to everybody, but that should be the, the, the guiding principle or maybe the rules. Then you have exceptions just to confirm the rule. Over. Thank you, Joba. And moving on to another question now, which I think covers a couple of interesting aspects that we've touched on briefly in, in the, the contribution so far. So Siobhan Franklin is asking what the panel's thoughts are on promoting a longer term view regarding pragmatic approaches. Her experience is that the limited short term approach being driven or forced on emerging markets by donor funders, which doesn't seem to work for the long term outcomes and impacts that we want to generate with regards to food security. So I think there's probably a couple of uh, interesting aspects there. If anyone would like to make a start on that one, Michael or Esther. Astrid, do you want to go ahead? <laughs> um, okay, so I agree with uh, with that. I, I'm sorry, I didn't get I didn't get your name, but I agree with you and your comment. So that's that the, we should be thinking of uh, de development activities in the more longer term approach, uh, five years, even ten years, and then break it down into like more short term, like one year or two years what what we we are a farmers organization and we have been a recipient of uh, several grants and many of the grants that we had were very short term like six months or, or one year so uh, it, it it's very difficult because it's very difficult in terms of sustainability because it's always uh, all we're, we're always like uh, also being in the subsistence level no we are we are always uh, concerned with how to to move forward with our steps uh, with our ambition or our vision so um, it is really very good that if donor, if development partners can really uh, partner, for example, with farmers organizations in the longer term, and that's why with IFAD we are we are 
happy because uh, there is a partnership with farmers organizations for like five years of IFAD and with EU and with SDC. There are partnerships that go until five years and they are, we, we are, we are compelled, we are compelled, we are motivated to make our own strategic plan, our own vision and mission, and that these longer term projects are, we have to make, we have to align no, these longer term projects to our vision and mission so that we, it could be sustainable. And what we're, we're also doing as part of like adaptation and resilience uh, in, in, in the, in the short-term projects is we have this strategic plan as a farmer's organization. And then when we get short-term short contracts, short-term projects like six months or one year, we have to make sure that we can find this kind of activity in our overall strategic plan so we know what it can contribute. It's very difficult uh, for farmer's organizations to get into, to get into uh, longer-term projects because in for the past years, uh, there is very low credibility among with uh, uh, credibility with farmers organizations as recipients of of bigger grants. So uh, we also thank uh, development partners like IFAD to uh, to that that helps us that gives us uh, grants to build our capacities as a professional, as a trust, trustworthy and a credible and legitimate organization, build our capacities to partner, for example, with government for the other large ag agriculture programs that they have. So back to you, Helen. Great, thank you, yeah. Esther. Michael. Sure, yeah, I, you know, I, I very much agree that we need a long-term approach. And I think that's, I think, that's particularly important for, uh, for innovation. And you know, let me give another example of, um, and this would be an example of a program that was developed by BRAC uh, in Bangladesh initially. This is the graduation approach. This is to address fundamental food security issues for the most disadvantaged people, the poorest of the poor. They, they thought, okay, our microfinance programs are not reaching these people. We need something else. And they, 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 they developed a program in which uh, an asset, typically a livestock asset, would be provided. And, um, there'd also be income support. There'd be training. There'd be various types of support, all done by, this, uh, by, by, by BRAC, uh, an organization from Bangladesh. Now, what they did, instead of just giving short-term support for this, there was funding to very carefully evaluate this and test the approach. And this has now been followed for, for, for uh, quite some period of time. And we've seen tremendous results from this. Farmers are moving out of absolute poverty and there seems to be a long-term long -term escape from a poverty trap. And this is now being adapted for many other countries. And it's also being tested in other countries in India and in Ethiopia, Uganda, and the, the results are coming back similarly in, in, in these other places. So this, you know, the evaluation, the careful evaluation, the development of the, of the new approach, that's something that can't be done quickly. And, you know, but it's essential to, to getting the full potential of this. And now we have something that governments are adopting themselves, for example, in, in India, and is really reaching millions of people. So I think this is, um, I think building in careful assessment and evaluation, iteration of new approaches um, is, is vital. And that, that does require a long-term commitment. Thank you, Michael. And we're actually already up to our hour mark, which is unbelievable. It's gone so quickly and there's still so many interesting issues I feel that we're yet to, dis that, to discuss, including one question that raised the topic of a Paris-style agreement for food systems, which I would have loved to have gone into. Joel Baird, did you want to just come in for one last remark before we close the session today? It looks like you wanted to say something there. Yeah, I just want to very quickly um, uh, really um, come back on this uh, long-term approach, which is vital, and to endorse the point made by Esther and, 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 and Michael, and this is exactly what if, if I, uh, is about. At the same token, I believe that message, within that message, to also go more often to the taxpayers, 
um, because that was the taxpayer that in fine will be financing ODA and the activity we are carrying out. What is happening, and we know it, um, Michael knows that very well, as well as Esther, um, it's, it's, still, it's still always everything being equal, relatively easier to mobilize resources when we have short-term crisis, a humanitarian or alike, than to mobilize resources for the long-term development and lasting and sustainable activity. So we really need to make sure that those long-term results or the principle of investing in long-term, um, it's also been understood by um, on the, 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 the taxpayers. And, and again, um, I, 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 my last point is that the, the Paris Agreement, I wish we had time to get into that. And this is also some, some one of the elements, I was in Paris three weeks, um, or four weeks ago now uh, with one planet summit um, where it's going to be essential for us to see the linkage between the, 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 the Paris Agreement in agriculture in general and the adaptation um, in the rural community as well. Over. Thank you, Chilba, and thank you to Esther and Michael as well for a really interesting discussion today. And thanks to everyone for participating as well. And these issues, as I mentioned at the beginning, are issues that we're actively working on and engaged on at Chatham House. So do uh, keep um, abreast of our work by looking, checking on our website and also for social media updates and Thanks again, everybody. Have a great rest of your day wherever you are. Goodbye. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Goodbye to all. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you so much. Goodbye to all. Bye-bye.